You know, in that video, the little sister had some great words for her big sister. I love you. That's a good one. You are my best friend. That's another one. You are awesome. And in case you missed it, and by the way, don't hit people. You kind of wonder if that's a uh, recurring issue maybe in, in family life there. Don't hit people. It would be very hard for the big sister or for any of us to miss that point, right? I mean, we will walk away. You will walk away more with that than you will probably anything else I say. And yet, if we're not careful, we seem to miss the point completely spiritually at times. This morning, Jesus is going to help his struggling disciples not miss the point. Well, because he loves them. He is indeed their best friend. And he knows that they are awesome. Sometimes an awesome mess, but awesome. And so the question is this morning, are you willing to let Jesus help you today. I want you to know that that choice has an eternal consequence. It's real. Let's pray and ask God to open our eyes so that we can see clearly. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day, God. We thank you that you do love us. Uh, God, I pray that, uh, that we will be aware, attentive, uh, open to your truth uh, not the words necessarily I say, God, but what you are saying to us through your text today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your copy of God's Word, we are back in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. We will be beginning uh, our reading when we get there at verse 14. Uh, You know, I want you to know that as we've been looking at this text, that historically Mark wants us to see how people respond to Jesus. You might recall uh, last week we saw that, well, there were some Pharisees and they didn't respond to Jesus so well. The outline for today's message is going to be really similar, but the text is going to be different because we're going to be dealing with a different group of people. Mark has introduced Jesus to the world as the one promised by the prophets. We saw that way back in chapter 1. The one that was spoken of by John the Baptist, who preached the good news of God. That is who he is. The one who asked all who he encountered to follow him. And that's what he's asking us today. He's asking you and I to follow him. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Today could be the day that you start following him for the very first time. Or if you do, he's just simply saying, hey, continue to walk with me. Walk closer. Listen to the words that I have for you. So Mark records that Jesus often traveled by boat. You know, in in our family, we joke, you know, because there's movies where people travel by map. You know, it's like we we condense the story around and we just show a little dot moving on a map and we kind of get there. But here we're going to see that Jesus, if you pay attention, he traveled by boat a lot around the Sea of Galilee, where he performed numerous miracles that physically helped people. See, Jesus went out on a boat and he shared the first parables. He did that to teach them the ways of the kingdom. So he put, got pushed out on the boat, allowed the natural dynamic there, the water, the, the, the beach, to amplify his voice so that all could hear him. Jesus sailed by a boat one evening where he stilled a raging storm that came upon the disciples, allowing him to show his complete power over nature. 
Jesus crossed over by a boat where he healed a synagogue official's daughter and a woman whose life had been ruined by a prolonged bleeding, revealing that faith meets needs. Jesus went away by boat, and after coming ashore, he began to teach the gathered multitude and later fed well over 5,000 after multiplying just five loaves of bread and two fish, showing that God brings true satisfaction. While food might fill our belly, Jesus will fill our life. He will give us all that we need. Jesus had the disciples go ahead of him by boat, and later he came to them walking on the water, providing encouragement and spiritual growth, what they needed. Last week, we saw that Jesus entered a boat and went to the district of Dalumantha, where he was met by Pharisees who rejected him by putting him to the test and demanding a sign, where if you will recall, Jesus did nothing. One of the only times that he didn't do anything. Jesus then left the Pharisees by boat and went to the other side, where he will say and do some things today that we're going to read to help his disciples see clearly. Now, I'm not saying that we go looking for secret signs in Scripture. Right? That's not what I'm getting at at all. But you can see sometimes where there are patterns that maybe there are things that we pay attention to. So Mark highlights these seven times of travel where Jesus taught his disciples what they needed to know about the kingdom of God, just as Moses had gone up on the mountain seven different times to give the people of Israel the law of God. That on that mountain, we record the times that he went up and down. In fact, if you want to kind of help put the Old Testament into perspective, most of Exodus takes place at that mountain. All of Leviticus takes place at the mountain of God. The first ten chapters of Numbers take place there. Significant things happened as Moses went up and down that mountain, just as significant things were taught as Jesus got in and out of a boat. Mark has previously shared what happens when some rejected Jesus, when they rejected what he said and did. And today, he will do the same for those struggling to consider the choice set before them in, this, in their consequence. So whereas the Pharisees rejected, today we're going to see a group of people who are struggling. They're struggling with, what, how do I put together what this man is saying? This friend of mine who's saying, this one who has demonstrated all this incredible power, the one that, man, we wonder, is he really the Messiah? And so Mark is going to show us how Jesus is going to deal with that. And so you have your copy of God's Word. Mark writes in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 14, these words, and they had forgotten to take bread. So see, they had gotten into the boat after the Pharisees. They had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving them orders saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss one another the fact that they had no bread. Yeah. And Jesus, aware of this, right, because he's there with them. I mean, that's a polite way of saying, <sighs> right? I mean, and so why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread do you not yet understand? Do, do you have hardened hearts? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces that you picked up? And so by now, they're finally paying attention. Uh, 12? 12? 
When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large basket full of broken pieces did you pick up? Oh, so they're paying seven. Oh, I got this one. It was seven. Verse 21 says, and when he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And so they came there near to Bethsaida. And they brought, as they gotten out of the boat, they brought this man to Jesus who was blind, and they were imploring him. That's a big fancy word to saying, begging, please touch him. Because at least these folks knew the touch of Jesus could change everything. So verse 23 says, taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on them, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, and he began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. So, there's some things going on theologically here that are really cool for you and I. Some things that I think will be important for these disciples who are listening Mark wants us to know the outcome of our choices concerning Jesus. He wants us to know. He thinks that's important. He wants them to know the cause and effect. Last week we saw that they chose, the Pharisees did, to reject Jesus. The result was, well, Jesus did nothing for them. Their lives were unchanged. It was sad. Here we're going to see Jesus helps those who struggle choose what is best. So where he had done nothing for those who had rejected him, here those who are struggling, they're not maybe on the fence, but they're trying to work things out. He wants to help them. I love this because you and I sometimes struggle, do we not? Even if we don't know Jesus, we, we struggle. Maybe we haven't rejected him, but yet we're looking and we're wanting the disciples had chosen to focus on the physical and the tangible aspects of their journey, right? Sometimes you and I do that, right? We focused on the stuff going on around us. They had failed to consider the spiritual reality of the Pharisees' rejection that had taken place. That was a big lesson. They missed out on that. How so much they missed out on it? Well, because all they were concerned about was what? their bellies, the bread. They were concerned with the forgotten bread that was either just overlooked or maybe just outright neglected, right? They just thought, well, somebody's going to get the food. And so Jesus was going to help them rightly focus on the spiritual. And so Scripture says that Jesus was giving them orders, Okay, and you think, whoa, orders? Well, he's instructing them. He's going to use the topic at hand, which I think is really cool, right? He's not going to pull something out of, you know, thin air. He's going to bring something that, that's relevant to what's going on. And so the word that he uses, this phrase, giving them orders, literally means to be set apart. It's an explicit command that is unambiguously clear, okay? It's crystal clear. He's saying, hey, pay attention. This is what I'm saying. It's completely clear. You need to understand this. So where the disciples had failed to set apart the bread, Jesus is now telling them that they need to be set apart from the way that the Pharisees and the Herodians, that's the, the political people, Herod, who was the, the tetriarch of the area, the ruling authority, Jesus is telling them that you need to live differently than the Pharisees. You need to live differently than the politicians, all right? And he does this by talking about leaven, all right? Leaven is what makes bread rise. And so he's doing that. They were talking and consumed about bread, so now Jesus is going to teach them what they need to know by talking about what they were talking about. Beware 
of the leaven. Oftentimes in Scripture, leaven is a symbol for sin. It's a symbol for evil because a little part of it can impact all of life. Just as we're told that just a little bit of leaven, right? will leaven or yeast up the entire batch of dough, just a little bit of sin can impact and fully permeate your life. Those who end up in places that they never thought they would end up in life never just jumped off into the deep end of stupid. They walk there slowly, occasionally, a little bit at a time until, oh my goodness, what have I done? Where am I at? That's why this symbol is often used for sin. And so where the disciples lacked focus, right? Because they're, they're not paying attention to what's going around. It's all about the bread. Jesus tells them to watch out. He tells them to beware. Two words that are really similar, but man, he's wanting them to get it, right? It's, he wants it to be crystal clear. He's telling them to beware of the sinfulness of the Pharisees, of the Herodians. He wants them to see. He wants them to give their attention. He wants them to not just pay attention. He wants them to understand why they need to be different why they need to change their actions, that they need to be more mindful of the spiritual. See, one of the great lies that we tend to understand or we've accepted is that we try to separate the physical or practical life and the spiritual life. We try to make it think like, okay, there's what I do every day, and then there's what I do when I think about God. There are no two different ways Everything is spiritual. Scripture tells us that we are either living for God or we are either living for Satan, right? I mean, we will either love one and hate the other. I mean, and so all of life is spiritual. And he's telling them that they're missing it, that by focusing on this one thing, they're missing what's going on. And so where the disciples were now a little distracted by what seemed more pressing, right? The bread. Do we have enough? Am I going to get full? Jesus wanted them to see how their behavior could eventually lead, right, to them becoming more like the Pharisees, to becoming more like the Herodians. So as they're here talking about bread, maybe that's that first step of distraction to where then they start focusing here. Jesus is trying to keep them from ending up in that spot where all of a sudden they look up and go, Oh my. So what is exactly this little bit of leaven of the Pharisees possibly? Well, the Pharisees had come to the point where they chose to mix cultural beliefs with the ways of God. It's not that they elevated the way of God. It's that they kind of took some of this and some of this and some of this. Oh, and the ways of God. And let's kind of put all that together. We have to be mindful of that. It's God's way above all things. Not that everything in society is bad. But nothing in society is equal with the ways of God. They chose to misrepresent the ways of God by loosely applying his truth. They selectively apply the truth of God. You and I got to be careful of that. We can't just say, oh, I like this part and I don't like this part. I'm going to follow this part and I'm going to pretend that this, well, it only works in certain circumstances, right? All God or nothing. That's what idol worship is. It's not all God. It's just a little bit of something else. And before we realize it, it's a whole lot of bit of something else and not so much of God. They wrongly drew distinction between themselves and others. Well, obviously, I'm better than you, right? And so it led people to believe that they could never be good enough for God. Oh, the last thing we want to do is to be so upset with the world around us because it's not godly that all the world sees is that we're doing this and we're doing this, and they don't think that God loves them and can change them the way he's changed us. Yes, we hold true to the standard of God, 
And that standard is that God loves them too. And he wills that they not perish just like he willed that we not perish. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. But what about that little bit of leaven of the Herodians, the politicians? Well, that led them to see only their self-interest. And so we got to be careful. Are we only focused on me, what I want, what I can get? That's problematic. They chose to manipulate to further their ways. How can I work this group and this group and do this and do that so that I can get you know, we got to be careful that we don't bring the ways of the world into, you know, the way that God tells us that we are to live because God does not manipulate. They chose to base rightness on popular acceptance, popular opinion. I'm here to tell you that just because a majority of people agree about something, does not make it so. Might does not make right. A hundred people screaming and one people saying no does not make a hundred people right. It's not about the majority. But yet that's what they did. They, they, they based rightness on popular acceptance. They, they pushed people to rely on themselves or the political establishment rather than God. You don't think we do that? Well, hey, how's your truth doing? I don't care about your truth because I've got my own truth. I mean, we've got an entire society trying to tell us what life really is and when it begins and who can be what and where. It's an amazing that we live in a society that says that I can choose to be male or female, but I can't choose to be black or white. I mean, so many inconsistencies, so much weirdness going on. It's not about relying upon ourselves. It's about relying upon God. So Jesus helps those who struggle to avoid greater consequences. Jesus said, beware. Jesus said, understand and pay attention because he knew they were here and he didn't want them to be there. He wanted them to have a better end result than what they were having. The disciples failed to grasp the help Jesus offered in this teachable moment. Because they went right back to talking about the bread, right? Jesus said, beware of the leaven. And then they were right back at it. It's like they didn't even hear him. They weren't even paying attention to what was going on. If we're not careful, we're that way, right? We can hear the truth of God. We can read the truth of God. We know it and we can say, but. And that's where the disciples were. And so Jesus now, he's going to get their full attention. He's going to ask them a series of seven types of questions hmm, to correct their behavior to bring an end to their struggle. As Moses had gone up on the mountain, as Jesus had taught from the boat, each seven times to completely share and provide the people what they needed, Jesus now is going to offer a complete guide for the rightful correction of those who are in error. And so what's he do? He asks, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you so concerned with the bread? He does this to stop them and to create a moment of separation from what's wrong. Hey, we're going to draw a line right here. We need you to be in this moment. Stop. That's where correction starts. He asks them about their understanding. He calls them to consider the possibility that something needs to be different. Hey, have you thought about this? He asked them if their hearts are hardened because he wants them to examine the rightfulness of themselves. So he says, stop, consider. Now I want you to think about, I want you to think about what you've done. I mean, that's kind of that kind of idea. Think about what's going on in your life. Is it right? Is it wrong? He asked if they see and hear. 
because they need to pay attention to what's going on around them and its impact. Hey, are you aware that your focus here is impacting you, is impacting potentially other people? So we've been told to stop, and now, as we're considering, Jesus is now getting us to the point where we're thinking about others along with ourselves, because normally, if we're not careful, it's all about me, right? It's all about I. And so he's telling us here this. He asked them if they remember what God has done for them and others right? Do you remember when I fed the 5,000? Do you remember when I fed the 4,000? He wants them to recognize God's way as the right standard of life. So when it comes to correction, when it comes to disputes, that's the point everything needs to get back to. What does God say about it? What has God done about it. Everything that Jesus did when he fed those 5,000 and 4,000 was to show everything I have to offer you will completely satisfy you. Word, deed, everything. And so now at this point of correction, he's saying, consider the nature and the truth of God. Where is your heart with that? How is that impacting other people? What are you considering it? You've stopped now. We've come to this point. He asked them for specifics about his actions, right? He asked them. He wanted to engage them in the process. He wanted them to acknowledge and agree. It's one thing to have heard the truth of God. It's one thing to say or think that, yeah, you're okay with it, but it's something else for you to actually confess it and act upon it. That's why Jesus calls us to confess our sin, why he tells us to call upon him, to turn what we say we believe into an action to demonstrate that both of those things are a reality. So he says, how many, how many basketfuls? Each and, you know, and they had to respond. They had to acknowledge it. You and I have to come to a point where we have to say, am I going to acknowledge the reality and the truth of God, who he is, what he says is right, and what we're going to do, right? That's it. And so lastly, He asked them if they still don't understand. What he's doing is he's inviting them to change. Because that's what the whole point is. The point of correction is not to inflict pain. The point of uh, of correction is not to shame. The point of correction is not to make somebody feel bad or sorrowful. It's what? It's to change to be in line with what God has to say because at one point we were not in line with God. Correction is a good thing, right? Because if I could tell you math, math is important. I mean, maybe you liked math, maybe you didn't. I did. I didn't like geometry, but I liked everything else. But you might say, man, I don't need math until you step on an airplane. Now, you might say, I don't need math, but some engineer somewhere needed some math because the last thing you want is to be taking off into the wild blue yonder and somebody to have made a grave miscalculation, right? That's bad. I mean, maybe there's not enough fuel on board for the weight. Maybe air is not going to flow over this wing as it was designed to do. Maybe a stress point that was supposed to last 50,000 hours is going to come short at 37,000 hours, and you better hope you're on the right side of 37, right? And so somewhere at some point, it was okay to tell that student, you're not doing the math right. You need to change. It will impact you. It will impact you that if you're taking care of your cows wrong. 
It'll impact you if you're not maintaining your equipment right, right? I can keep going on and on and on. Correction is not necessarily bad. Correction is good because deep down, we want to do it right. We really do. And so that's what Jesus has done here. He's called them to change. And because the disciples were willing to receive that help with their struggles rather than reject it, right? I mean, they could have said, nope, we're done, like the Pharisees. But since they didn't, man, Jesus is going to offer some proof that brings some absolute clarity. Upon exiting the boat, a blind man is brought to Jesus, right? Somebody who obviously cannot see. So Jesus takes him out of the village. He, he's involved with this man, and he involves the man in this process. Could Jesus have healed him just by saying, hey, you're healed? Could he have just touched his eyes once and healed him? He could have. He's done it elsewhere. But you notice here that Jesus does two different things. He, he, he does stuff, and the man can see, but still can't quite see clearly. So Jesus does more. He's involving the man in the process. God wants us to be involved in the process of life with him, to participate. Being a Jesus person is not a spectator sport. It's a participating sport, right? We're not on the sidelines. We're not on the bench. Each and every one of us is on the field of play. And so he's involved this man, and he does something he heals him so that now he sees not, and not at all, and not just kind of figuratively, but now he sees what Scripture says? Clearly. And then he tells him, don't go back into the village. Don't go back to that old way, right? This miracle completes what Jesus has been teaching from the boat he shared how his truth is superior over the ways of the world, revealed that his power overcomes all things, showed how faith meets needs, illustrated that his, he has the ability to completely satisfy. He's demonstrated his willingness to encourage and help us grow while declaring that those who reject him get nothing, but that those who receive him see clearly eyes wide open. They're able to see. They're able to perceive. Jesus illustrates that me must be willing to step away from what has blinded us, right? Engage him and allow him to be active in our life and not return to the old way, right? You touch the stove and it's hot and you go, ooh, and then you say, I don't want to do that again. You just don't keep doing this. And so he calls us to change. Mark wants us to choose the right response of Jesus. That's the practical story of what's going on here. And so you need to accept the correction of Jesus. I know that's what you really wanted to hear this morning. You wanted to hear that, yes, God has a standard. And that when that standard conflicts with what I want to do, that I get to do whatever I want. No, we are to do what God has laid out because it's best. And so what I'm going to tell you is, don't get mad that Jesus is correcting you. It's not his fault. It's whose fault? It's our fault. It's our fault. But you also need to realize that correction is a demonstration of love, not the fact that Jesus just wants to get angry. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 12. Scripture says, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Yeah, nobody wakes up and says, oh, yes, correct me, punish me. 
But here he says, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, wait for it. Here it is. It means that you are illegitimate and that you are not really his children at all. Correction's not bad. Correction is good. The disciples struggled. They were taught. Jesus corrected them so that they could see things clearly. And they did, and they moved on. Next week is going to be an amazing week where you're going to see what it's like when people get it. Here, they made the right choice. Lastly, you need to let Jesus open your eyes so that you can see clearly. Maybe today you can't. Don't remain darkened in your own understanding. Don't be excluded from a life with God because your heart is hard. Instead, take this opportunity this morning, this opportunity that Jesus has provided you, and ask him to save you. Are you willing to tell others that Jesus can be in charge of your life and that you are persuaded that his way is the best? I mean, that's pretty much a, a Brian version of Romans 10, 9 right there, right? You're persuaded, you have faith, you call upon him because you have a need. I mean, Romans 10, 13 just basically says, if you ask, he will save you. I mean, that's how complicated it is. Not complicated at all. And then eyes open. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe you're struggling today. Hey, you don't have to struggle anymore. I'm not even here to tell you that the struggle is bad or that struggle is wrong because the struggle has brought you to this point. The struggle has given you an opportunity to hear the truth of God. The struggle has given you the opportunity to respond. Now, to continue to struggle, yeah, that'd be sad. You don't have to. The disciples were struggling, but they let Jesus help. You've seen that Jesus teaches, he corrects, man, and he provides the right thing for you to see so that you don't miss the point. Examine your life. If you need to change, let God show you the way. And if you need to be saved, let today be the day of salvation. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us here. God, we thank you for offering us salvation when we don't deserve it. God, let us step out. Let us proclaim with our mouth. Let us declare that we want to follow you for all of our life. Not that we have it all figured out, but that we want to follow and be with you because you do. If someone needs to be saved, let that happen now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.